I believe the word. I work on the word. The word works on me. Say it with conviction. Say, I receive the word. I believe the word. I work on the word. The word works on me. Now I'm speaking unto you today. It's a prayer first. I'm speaking unto you on something I've tried to pray through my prophecy. Say, pray through my prophecy. Say, pray through the prophecy. Yes. Now, prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy is... Uh, the main channel through which God communicates to his people. When we say someone has given a prophecy, that means the person has spoken under divine inspiration to a person or to a group of people. And that inspiration that is spoken to you or concerning a situation is that that inspiration communicates the mind of God. It communicates the intent of God. It communicates the will and the purpose of God concerning your life, your situation, or a circumstance. But now, after prophecy has been given, you don't just have to sit down and just drink tea and coffee and expect that the prophecy will automatically happen. Are we here? After God gives you a word, there are certain things you need to do in order to make that prophecy come to pass. Uh, I've gone through it some in the past with, a, with you, but I just today I just want to um, emphasize on the part of prayer and waiting. Now, the first thing you need to do when you receive a prophetic word or God tells you something or you 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 get a rema from the word of God every way. God speaks in so many ways. God does not only speak through prophets. God speaks through you. God speaks through his word. God speaks through so many ways. Regardless of the manner in which you receive a word from God, you need to know what you've got to do in order to make that word come to pass. How many here you have received a word from God before? God has told you something. Let, let me see you by hand. Some people, they have never heard God speak in, in, in any way. How many, how many of you here, you have never heard God speak? Let me hear. Let me see. You have never heard God speak. God has never spoken to you before. So that means every one of us, God has spoken to us before somehow. Wonderful. Good. So now, after God has given you a word, what do you need to do in order for that word that God has given you to come to pass? I, I always say, when prophecy comes or when a word of revelation comes to you, it is just like this. The word that is sent through whoever the person that delivers the message is just a messenger. For instance, let me give you an example. Let's say maybe I'm preaching and then uh, you receive a rema from the word I'm preaching. I didn't possibly call you by name, but you receive a word that that word I spoke is personally for you. Because most of the time when words are come, before any man of God speaks up, possibly they wait on the Lord, receive a word and come to give to you. Like when I was meditating in the course of the week, what I should tell House of Grace Nairobi West on a Sunday. Now God gives me a word, assuming this is the word that God has given me. Then it's come, let me just use it to demonstrate something. Now watch this. Any time a word comes from the pulpit, it is the word of the God. Amen? Amen? Every word that comes from the pulpit, from this altar, it is God speaking to you. So don't ever think you have never heard God. Once you have heard a sermon, you have heard God speak. Because if God was to come to you last Sunday and give you a word, the same thing he would have told you on the Sunday is the same word that came to you on last Sunday. And this Sunday, if God is to appear to you and tell you something, what you are hearing now is what he would have told you. Are we together? Are we together? So now, as I wait on God, let's assume this man is the pastor. And you are the congregants. Um, 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 the gentleman here represents everyone. So, I am God. Now, I want to tell this man something. But because for one reason or the other, he may not be able to assimilate it or interpret what I have said. What I, give, what I do is I give it to my representative or my servant. Now, take it. Now, he goes and give the message to him. Now, the message is not for the deliverer. The message is for the recipient. So when you have now received the message, you need to know what you've got to do to make sure that that message comes to pass in your life. 
It is not the responsibility of the deliverer of the message to make sure that your prophecy comes to pass. It is the responsibility of the recipient of the message and the giver of the message to make sure that that message or that prophecy comes to pass. Are you following me? So after he has received the word, now he needs to know what he has to do to make sure that that word comes to pass. The first thing that you need to know in order for your prophetic word to come to pass is that you receive the word of God in faith. Somebody say in faith. Say in faith. Because faith becomes the substratum for every prophetic word to grow. Faith becomes the soil. The word, as Jesus said, in the gospel is the seed. You, the recipient of the word, you are the soil. So when the word falls on you and you don't provide a conducive environment for that word to grow and to mature and to be fulfilled, there is no way that that word can be fulfilled. So when a word comes to you, when Bishop stands here or any man of God stands here and declares over you, life is going to be good, God is going to turn your story around, immediately that word leaves the altar to you. You receive it in faith. And you believe it. That's why I said receive the word, believe the word, and work on the word. You receive the word, you believe it that once God has sent his servant to declare that one to you, it shall happen. Now let me ask you this. I always say this. That God has no business lying to you. Why will God tell you something he cannot do? What would he gain? The Bible says in Numbers 23 and 19 that God is not a man to lie. Neither the son of man to repent. Has he said it and shall he not do it? Has he spoken and shall he not make it good? Most of the time when God's word comes to you, it may not look it, it may not sound it, but he is committed to fulfilling it. You just have to do what you need to do in receiving the word in faith and believing it. Hebrews 6, 18, the Bible says, by two imitable things, it is impossible for God to lie. Every word that God gave you, whether five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, he's committed to making it come to pass. So when you receive a word, make sure you receive it in faith. And after you have received the word in faith, you don't just receive it in faith, now you pray on the word, work on the word. Touch your neighbor and say, work on the word. <laughs> Give me first Timothy 1, 18. How did we? First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Shall we read? No, one, go. Mm-hmm. 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 The second thing you need to do after receiving a prophecy is to pray on the prophecy. If God tells you in your closet of prayer that my daughter, my son, I'm going to work this miracle out for you. God has given you a prophecy. If you are reading the Bible, you get a rema from it and it is personalized for you. That is a prophecy. If you come to church and the pastor declares something and you capture a rema for it, that is a prophecy. Now, after you have received the prophecy in faith, you've got to pray through that word. He says, this charge I commit to do to you, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies you have received, that thou mightest by them wage a good word, warfare. Prophecy is not for celebration. The word of God is not for jubilation. The word of God brings responsibility on you to pray through the word to make it happen. Prophecy does not exempt you from responsibility or duty. It causes you, it should cause you to pray. Let me take it again. Prophecy, let's say I come here and I declare unto you, you are going to get married. God is saying this and that and that. You, it should not tell you, oh, because God has said it, that is it. It will just happen. You've got to work on it. Amen? Please take me to the scripture, please. Say, this. 
this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that was made concerning you, that by them you what? Wage a good warfare. Because once God declares the prophecy, there is also the enemy whose responsibility is to make sure that the same word God has declared has not come to pass. Listen to me. The Bible says that God said, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of good and not of evil to give you a hope and an expected end. God has his plans for you which are good and to give you a hope and an expected end. But the devil also fights the will of God so that that which God has decided decided to do does not come to pass. That is why every now and then, when you receive a prophecy, you've got to battle through that word to make sure that that word God has given you come to pass. Otherwise, you may live and see the prophecy um, and receive the prophecy, but may never see the manifestation of the prophecy. Are we here? So when God tells you something, or you got a vision that you know came from God, you've got to pray through it until you see the manifestation of that vision. Until you see the manifestation of that prophetic word. Otherwise, you may just dream it, think it, jubilate with it, and then nothing might happen. He says, because of the prophecy, wage war. That's what he means, wage war. Why do you have to wage war? You need to battle in prayer and be able to fight so that the word that God has given you shall manifest. Can you imagine? God calls Moses. You know, this is the simple epitome of prayer in the New Testament church. God calls Moses and says, Moses, I have given my children Israel the land of Canaan. They should go and possess it. I want you to listen to this very carefully. God tells them in Numbers chapter 13, I have given them the land of Canaan. They should go and possess it. If the Israelites have been given a land to possess, I believe when they get to the land, the land is supposed to be vacant. But when they got to the land, they were the Canaanites on the land. The Hethites, the Amorites, all of them have conquered the land God said he has given them. Let me ask this. If God says he has given me this seat, why should somebody be on it? Are you getting me? Do you know how they possess the land? They had to fight. They had to battle and kick them out to possess a land God said he has given them. Wow. Something God said he has given them, still they had to fight to dethrone and check out the original occupants of the land. What am I trying to say? God might have given you a word, but you've got to battle in prayer so that you will be able to possess and see the word manifest. Otherwise, you may never live to see it. Assuming they got there and they started playing. Oh, God says we are coming to take the people would have killed them. They would have, they had the prophecy all right. But they just sat on the prophecy thinking, you know, God says we have come to take the land. You leave this place. The people, they had to fight. Now, in the Old Testament, they fought canal battles, physical battles in order to possess. But in the New Testament, we don't fight like they fought. Because the Old Testament was a shadow of the New. It's my shadow here. You know a shadow? You know, my shadow is behind me. It's my shadow that we all think. The real me is here. My shadow is behind me. The real thing is not the Old Testament. The real thing is the new. So in the Old Testament, they fought physical battles in order to possess their prophecies. But in the New Testament, we don't fight with guns and cutlasses in order to possess. We fight through the spirit. We fight through prayer. We fight with the sword, which is the word, and pray through in order for us to possess our possession. Give me 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 4. Quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 4. Second, okay. The Bible says, let me quote it. He says that though we walk in the flesh, we do no war after the flesh. Say, though I walk in the flesh. I don't war, war after the flesh. Or I don't fight after the flesh. So though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In other words, though we are in the flesh, we don't fight according to the flesh. Because if everything you know is the flesh and physical things and physical ways on, of, of overcoming the enemy and physical ways of doing things, trust you me, you would always be over, overtaken by the enemy. Because this life is not only about the physical. The real life is spiritual. Are you getting me? Say, so though we walk in the flesh, we do not war. We don't fight according to the flesh. Now, 
if, if we don't fight according to the flesh, then how do we fight? He says, for the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, meaning physical, but they are mighty through God. That means that the weapons of prayer, the weapons of the word, the weapons we have, they are not like intercontinental ballistic missiles. They are not AK-47 and pistols, but they are mighty, meaning they are powerful. When you stay in your room and you kneel down and you begin to pray, it is powerful. When you begin to declare the word of God to the enemy, it is powerful. It may not be a gun. Yes. It may not be an atomic bomb. Yes. But the word of prayer that comes from your mouth, it is powerful. How powerful it is. He says it is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. My God. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a fortress. In other words, your prayer and your word is able to break down a fortress of an enemy. It's able to break down the protection and the powers of the enemy. It's able to pull down the things that the enemy has orchestrated over your life. That is why most of you, the enemy can do anything he wants in your life. Why? Because you are prayerless. Because you don't have any weapon. Are you getting what I'm saying? If the enemy, you know, the enemy use your home as a playground. Do anything he wants. Why? Because you've got a weapon. And if you have the weapon, thank you, Holy Spirit. If you've got a gun, yeah, and the gun is in your house, and you've got pistols in your house, and armed robbers come and you just face them. Me, I'm powerful. I've got a, don't you know I've got a gun in my house? Me, I'll shoot you. And the gun is in the bedroom, and you are meeting them in the lounge. I've got a gun in my house. Me, I've got a, they will shoot you and kill you. Yes, that is what we have been doing as Christians. We know how to pray, yes. We know how to study the word of God, yes. But when the devil comes, I've got a gun in my house. You are not praying. I've got a, the devil will finish you before you realize. Are you getting what I'm saying? A bullet is not lethal. If I throw a bullet right now to Angel, she will not die. If I throw it to her, she will not die. But when I put the bullet in a gun and I pull the trigger, it becomes lethal. The word of God, the Bible on your table in your bedroom is not lethal. It can't do nothing. The Bible can't do nothing. If you just put it there, it can't do nothing. But when you put the Bible in this gun and you release it from you, it becomes lethal in the camp of the enemy. When you declare to the enemy, no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. It has become lethal. It is able to break down the powers of darkness. When you declare to the enemy that that which you are doing to me, it is not possible. For the word of God says a thousand shall fall by my side and ten thousands by my right hand. But as for me, it shall not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I behold the reward and the salary of the wicked. Once you declare it, the enemy becomes frightened. The enemy knows you are shooting some guns and arrows in the, in the spirit. Don't just sit down. Begin to activate your weapon. That's when say, activate your weapon. When you can push in the spirit, I always say, things don't take me by surprise. Out of the hundred things that only about 20 or 15% will take me by surprise. But some way, somehow, I will have a witness. Why? Because you can train yourself to a level that things don't just take you by surprise. I've had three major accidents. Deadly ones. Anytime I sit, I sit in a car and it's about to have an accident, I feel it. I stop praying in tongues. Anytime I've had an accident, somehow, the first one, the one seated here died. The one seated here sustained serious injuries. I was in the middle. Nothing happened to me. Because immediately I sat in the car, I had a funny feeling. And I started praying in tongues. In London, twice, serious one. Just recently, actually the fourth one is just what happened before I came to Rungai. Serious major accident. I was just driving on a Sunday morning, just Please, my Mercedes, boom, on the motorway. And everything was everywhere. But immediately, I sat in the car. I knew something was going to go wrong. Listen to me. When you are in constant communication with the spirit, you, your spirit is able to pick signals. You have a phone, right? How many of you have a phone? Oh, today we didn't take selfies. Maybe second selfies. Se second service. We did. Oh, good, good, good. Now watch this. If you have a phone, and if even one of the greatest people in this country is calling you and your battery is dead, will you be able to receive the call? No way. Regardless.
regardless of who is calling your phone, if the battery is dead, you can't receive no signal. Some of you, the reason why you are not receiving signals is that spiritually you are dead. But once your phone is active, the person calls, you pick and you answer. I pray for you that you will be spiritually active. That you will be able to be sensitive from today. That you will charge your battery. Paul said, he that prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself. The word edify in the Greek is the Greek word oligodomio, which means to charge yourself up like you are charging a battery. My God. In other words, when you begin to pray, you are praying, you are charging your spirit up like you are charging a battery. When you begin to pray, you are edifying, you are emboldening your spirit. Touch your neighbor and say pray. No, 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 you say pray. Say pray. Say pray. Now, so, when you receive a prophecy, you need to pray through. Otherwise, you never see it. And after praying through, let me close on this note. You need to wait patiently. Say wait. And that is the most difficult aspect of our Christian work. The area of waiting. Hey! Because someone like me, I don't like to wait. Ever since I was young, I have never liked waiting. Even when I get into a restaurant and you delay me for 30 minutes, I start getting agitated. Is there someone like me? I'm confessing my sins. Why are you looking at me as if I'm the only one? <laughs> yes. Are you getting what I'm saying? Waiting is the most difficult aspect of our Christian work. When you know God is able, it's not like you don't know. You know God is able to do. You know God has given you the word. You know you have prayed so hard. But now your ability to wait for the prophecy to come to pass. You know, we believe the physical even more than the... Can I tell you something? Okay. Yeah, you do orders online. You order online and it comes to your house. You do it. You order things online and it comes to your house. Good. If you order something online and you pay for it, don't you have the faith that it will come? Do I have witness? You ought even you you send you you send um, you give some emphasis. You give somebody um, um, the guy at the tail somewhere. Maybe you were in uh, in Machakos. You give the guy send this emphasis money to my phone. You trust the guy with your twenty thousand, and you leave after at times it doesn't come automatically, but you still believe it will come, right? If we believe the things of the physical. That when we order things online, God will, the, 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 the deliverer and the supplier will deliver. Why is it that we, why can't we believe that when God says he's going to do something in our life, wait. God is not a man to lie. Neither the son of man to repent. As he said it and shall he not do it. As he spoken and shall he not make it good. Every word of God that he declares he's committed to. Give me first Samuel. Let me just run on. Say, wait. First Samuel chapter 16, reading from verse 1. Quickly, 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 quickly. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will thou, will you mourn for Saul, seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? One go, let's continue. Continue. Wow. Then invite Jesse to sacrifice and I will show you what you should do. Thou sh you shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Notice. Continue quickly. So someone did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? Quickly. And he said, peaceably, I come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to sacrifice. So it was when he, they came that he looked at Eliab. Now, the first prophet to make a mistake in the Bible was Samuel. But the Bible says his word never fall to the ground. This is not 
this is a Sunday service, so I can't explain deeper. Did I tell you? Every prophet can make a mistake. Likewise, every man of God can make a mistake. He says, Eliab said, and he said, so and it was that he came and looked at Eliab. Now, immediately the prophet Samuel looked at Eliab. He says, this is the Lord's anointed. My God. Surely, this is the Lord, the Lord anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, assuming I have come and God says, I should anoint somebody as uh, the next uh, governor in town. And I look at this guy. Because he looks good. He's thick, tall. Has sunglasses. That means, you know, when people like, wear glasses, people pretend they are intelligent. Jeez. <laughs> When you wear glasses and you put on a suit, people assume you are intelligent. Even if you can't read and write. Do I have, just wear a suit and check in the bank with the glasses. They will start respecting you, I'm telling you. Because he looks good and he's got the glasses, I've, I, 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 I come, this is the Lord's anointed. Maybe he may not be the one. So the Lord said to him, do not look at his appearance. Or his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord see it not as man see it. For man look it on the outward appearance, but God look it on the heart. Quickly. So Jesse called Abinadam and made him pass by before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. So Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this. Jesse made all seven of his sons pass by. God said, none of them. But when someone got there, someone told him, call me all your sons. So in the mind of Jesse, he had called all his legitimate sons. Can you imagine? Not knowing the illegitimate one was the one God wanted. My God. Today, just get ready. <laughs> and someone said to Jesse, I hear all, are they, all, all the young men here. Then he said, they remained yet the youngest. Yet he kept the sheep. And someone said to Jesse, send and fetch him. For we will not sit down till he comes here. Say, he will, he will not sit down till he comes here. Then he sent and brought him in, and he was ruddy and with the bright eyes and good looking, and he said, arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Say, this is the one. You are prophetic. Amen. Now, watch this. Let's, God bless his word and cause his word to bless his people. Now, this particular scripture came about when the children of Israel, um, as we all know, the Bible says that Israel was ruled by the prophets. Before, Israel was a theocratic nation. A theocratic nation is a nation that who, um, which, who, whose leader is God. Now, God was the one that was ruling and was in charge. But sometime Israel said, we also want to be ruled by a king. So now God gave them a king by the name of Saul. Say Saul. Now Saul was, came in, into the picture not because God wanted him to reign, but because the people pushed God to give them a king. So God gave them Saul. So Saul was not in the original plan of God initially because God was all this while preparing someone to bring to Israel. But Israel went ahead of God and pushed God in giving them a king. So that is why Saul makes few mistakes and God says, I have rejected you. What was the mistake of Saul? Just imagine it. Saul goes to battle. And God tells him, kill everybody and everything. Saul kills everything. He says, I'm bringing the fat cattle to sacrifice to God. Has he made a mistake? No. He's coming to sacrifice the fat cattle to God. And immediately the prophet sees the cattle coming with Saul. He says, why? What am I hearing? He says, uh, and the noise of cattle. He says, oh, God has rejected you for that. Number two, Israel is about to go to war. And according to the custom of the Jews, when they are going to war, they have to make sacrifices. That is why anytime you pray, I urge you to release the seed. Why? Because in the Old Testament, anytime they were going to war, they had to make sacrifices. You don't just pray with your mouth, you also pray with your sacrifice. So they were to make a sacrifice for them to go to war. And the person to do the sacrifice was this man called Samuel the prophet. Now, they waited for Samuel and the guy was not showing up. And this sacrifice is not for Samuel. It is unto God. So the, priest, the king said, okay, if the prophet is not coming, let us go ahead and make the sacrifice. And the guy makes the sacrifice. And immediately the prophet shows up and says, oh, God has rejected you. Why did you make the sacrifice? Really? Honestly, that wasn't fair. You delayed. You delayed in coming. And we went ahead and made the sacrifice to God. And you show up and you begin to say, obedience is better than sacrifice. You should have waited for me. That is not fair. I you get what I'm saying? Because the sacrifice is not for you. It is unto God. But the reason was simple. The reason why he was easily rejected by God was that he was operating out of the will of God. 
Any time, listen to this, any time you operate out of the will of God, the least thing, you get destroyed. Look at David. When he came on the throne, David did the worst things. But still, God says, this is a man after my own heart. The three major things God does not like, David did them. First, God says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. David coveted somebody's wife. Two, the Bible said, thou shalt not kill. David killed Uriah. Three, the Bible said, thou shalt not commit adultery. David committed adultery. All these three major transgressions of God, David did them, but still, God still said, this is a man after my own heart. Do you know why? It is simple. David was a man that was operating in the will of God. When you are in the will of God, even your mess is turned into a message. When you are out of the will of God, the least thing, you are exposed to attacks. So now, so is not, is, is operating out of God's will. So God wants to choose a new person. And so God calls Samuel, his prophet, and says to Samuel, go to Jesse's house. There is a man there. I want you to anoint him as king. Now, when he got to Jesse's house, he said, Jesse, call me all your sons. And Jesse, in his simple mind, called all his legitimate sons. Seven of them legitimate. He, didn't, he had got only one illegitimate son, who was David. And David was not loved, so David was in the wilderness. So all the seven sons come. Immediately the prophet sees Eliab. He says, this is the Lord's anointed. Come, let me anoint you as king of Israel. And now, immediately as he was about to anoint him, the prophet, God spoke, rebukes him and said, that is not the one. Because people would always associate with you because of how you look, the car you drive, the job you have, the amount of money in your bank account. But God, regardless of who you are, can still choose you. Regardless of how much you have, he can still choose you. How can God choose a guy who is in the wilderness? A wilderness boy, he doesn't live in the house. In contemporary terms, David was homeless. But he had a father. And when God wants a king to choose, he chooses a man that is homeless, whose birth is even questionable. Because David was born out of red lock. That's why in Psalm 51, he said, in sin did my mother conceive me. So the legitimate sons were rejected, but the illegitimate son was accepted and anointed. Can I tell you something? Regardless of the circumstances surrounding your birth, it's inconsequential. When God is ready to bless you, he shall bless you any way. Regardless of how relegated you have been by your family, how far you are, how far you have gone into the world, if God has destined and purposed to change your life, I came to declare to you, he will. Because the ways of God are not the ways of man, and the thoughts of God are not the thoughts of man. Now, some, David is anointed in the presence of his brothers. And if David is anointed in the presence of his brothers, the, the Bible makes me understand that his father still sends him to the wilderness. He is anointed as king of Israel. But his father still says, young man, you don't belong to this house. Go back to where you belong, the wilderness. And you know why? People always want to push you to where? You were. Even when God lifts you up, they still want to push you to where you belong. Can I tell you something? I declare over you today, regardless of what is going on, if people are worried because of the small blessing God has given you, they should get ready. After this prayer fest, they will have a heart attack. Why? Because God shall lift you to the place that he has purposed to and a bigger miracle, a bigger blessing, a bigger door shall be opened for you. If you are here, shout, I receive it. David was sent back to the wilderness. So in chapter 17, when he got to the field, um, he was anointed in chapter 16. And in chapter 17, when he got to the field, sent, his father called him back to the house and sent, and sent him with food to go to the, um, the, will, um, the, the field to give to the brothers. Eliab, the brother, said, with whom have you left the field sheep? Why are you here? You belong to the wilderness. You don't belong here. Have you been there? When people think you are not their class. Within a matter of hours, the same guy that said you don't belong here, David was elevated. Why? Because he was able to kill Goliath. I pray for you. Anybody that ever told you you don't belong to their class, may the Lord use you as a testimony to shock them. 
You belong to their class. Nobody is better than you. They've got one head. You have one head. Two hands. Two hands. Two eyes. Two eyes. One nose. One nose. Two ears. Two ears. What are you talking about? David is anointed. Let me try and round up. And then, in the midst of his brethren, the reason why David was the one that was chosen is this. David, all the time he was rejected by the family, he was on the wilderness. And that was the time he built a relationship with God. That was the time he built his spiritual life. All the guys that were in the house, they were eating and drinking. God said, you continue eating and drinking. If I want someone to be a king, I will go to the people that have waited on me. I'll go to the people that have waited on the Lord. People that are praying. People. David was every now and then waiting on God in the wilderness. So God saw him as a candidate to become a king and a candidate to lead his people. You know, sometimes when you are on the wilderness and you are praying, waiting on God, engaging in spiritual activity. Some people will think you are crazy. You are senseless. But I came to tell you, you ain't crazy. Something good, something powerful shall certainly emerge out of the thing people think is crazy. The Bible says God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to confound the mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised as God chosen. I prophesy over your life. People might have despise you but may you be the candidate for the next testimony if people might have rejected you like david but may you be the candidate to shock your world people might not see anything good out of you but i declare like david you are in the wilderness but let the king within you come alive you are in the wilderness but let the king within you come alive you are not you are single but the married man within you let it come alive you are broke but the prospect man within you let it come Come alive. Touch your neighbor and say, come alive. No, no, touch yourself. Say, come alive. Say, come alive. You know what? If God could remember a wilderness boy, I came to declare to you, Jehovah God shall remember you. If God could remember a rejected boy, I came to declare to you, God shall remember you. If God could remember a man who seemed whose birth was questionable, I came to declare to you, Jehovah can remember you. The other day, David on the, you know, can I tell you something? Do you know that all the Psalms that we read in the Bible, 90% of the Psalms we read in the Bible, they were written by David when he was in captivity and bondage. Have you ever thought of it? When he was in bondage and on the wilderness and he was struggling, that was when he wrote the Psalms. Now, from his experience we get psalms to read to encourage us it was on the wilderness when his father sent him to the wilderness the father thought he was relegating him to the background it was on the wilderness that he learned how to use the slink it was on the wilderness that his father pushed him in learning how to use the slink his father thought he was ending his destiny but his father didn't know he was making him up your enemies think they are breaking you down they are making you up arming you with weaponry to be able to counter future attacks i came to declare to you the same thing you will learn in your wilderness you shall use to overcome your devil he learned how to use the slink on the wilderness so david let me just run up for the sake of time and then david is anointed in the midst of his brethren. Can I get two gentlemen? Two. Two gentlemen. Two. Two. Two gentlemen. Quickly. David is anointed in the midst of his brethren. Now before David is anointed, he was on the wilderness and he took pen and paper and he began to write. That was when he was on the wilderness. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. Why? On the wilderness he had no father. He had no mother. All he saw was grass and sunshine. He said, the Lord is my shepherd yes he had no food but the lord is his shepherd he had nobody to take care of him but the lord is a shepherd things are bad but he still declared the lord is my shepherd he says i shall not want he makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me besides the still waters david was speaking into his future he was making prophetic statements he said he leads me beside the still waters he restores my soul he leads me in the path of righteousness for his namesake now he said yet though I walk 
through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. He said, thou anointed my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. And he said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me, not for two hours, not for one day, not for um, five years, but all the days of my life. Do you know what it means? This man is goodness. That is mercy. This is called goodness. That is mercy. Goodness follows you as a result of your good deed. Mercy is defined as exemption from judgment. Yeah? So David declares, my hair shall be anointed with oil and my cup will run over. And he said, goodness and mercy follow me. Follow me, sir, follow me. David made a prophetic statement that regardless of where he goes, how hard life becomes, there is something called goodness that will follow him. There is something called mercy that will follow him. So everywhere David was going, even in the wilderness and in the field, there was goodness following him. There was mercy following him. Even in the midst of battle, goodness followed him. In the midst of battle, mercy followed him. Can I prophesy over your life? I prophesy over your life. After today, the goodness of Jehovah shall follow you. The mercies of God shall follow you. Everywhere you go, prosper. Prosperity shall follow you. Everywhere you go, favor shall follow you. Everywhere you go, increase shall follow you. If I hear shout, I receive. I receive. I receive. Now, this is goodness. And that is mercy. Goodness follow you by your good deeds. Assuming I am David. I am walking and I make a mistake. Say mistake. Mistake means you were taking a step and you missed it. Mistake. I miss it. Immediately I miss it. Goodness says, sir, you missed it. I stop following you. Go sit down. When you miss it, goodness stops following you. But there is something called mercy. Mercy is defined as exemption from judgment. You were meant to have been judged because of what you did. But mercy says, you, I have been declared to follow you. Whether you missed it or you didn't miss it, there is something called the mercies of God. I am speaking to someone here. Possibly you missed it last night. You missed it last week. And you have been missing it. But I decree and declare, let the mercies of Jehovah be released over your life. Let the mercies of Jehovah be released over your family. Let the mercies of Jehovah be released over you. If you are here, shall I receive? Had they not been the mercies of God, some people would have been annihilated by the devil. But when the devil wants to strike you, mercy steps in and says, No, I know he missed it, but says, No, you can't touch him. When the devil wants to break you down, mercy steps in and says, No, when the devil wants to destroy you, mercy steps seen somebody say mercy David is anointed and then he says he still goes back to the wilderness and then he is torn and confused whether because the, the, the prophet comes and says you are the next king of Israel you are the next president in town and he's on the wilderness still homeless he's torn between whether Let's assume this is the president and this is the cowboy or the shepherd boy David. Now he's confused in the middle. Prophet said, I am the king. But here am I on the wilderness. That is where you are. The prophecy said you are going to be great. The prophecy said life is going to be good. The prophecy said the children are going to start behaving. But some way, somehow, you find yourself here. You know you are bigger than what you are right now. But you are in the middle. You are confused as to what is going to happen. Now, David had to learn the ability to wait for the manifestation of his prophecy. He was declared to on the wilderness that he is a king. But the guy had to wait for 13 good years. Before he was even anointed as the king of Judah. In the midst of the waiting, he was persecuted. In the midst of the waiting, he felt like throwing in the towel. In the midst of the waiting, he felt like giving up. But the guy waited. Can I tell you something? 
I, I, most of you are asking yourself, I, am I still going to stay single? Or oh, I'm going to get married one day? I, I, am I still going to remain broke? Or oh, life is going to turn out good one day? Is these children going to start misbehaving? Start behaving? Or oh, things are going to work out one day? You are like David who is anointed as a king, but, but in on the wilderness. But I hear the Lord saying, if David's prophecy came to pass, I declare your own prophecy, your own word shall manifest regardless of how hard things have become. God shall make the word come to manifestation. That's when everybody say, wait. And I tell you something, let me end on this. Dose. There are two sides of every individual. Say individual. Say in the V dual. Let's do a little English. Individual comes from a three syllable word, in, the V, and dual. In means within. The V means divisible. Dual means two. That means within every individual, it's a divisible part of two. In means within. The V means divisible. Dual means two. So within me standing here, it's a divisible part of two. There is the present me. And there is the future me. The present me is broke. The present me may not be married. The present me may be frustrated. But the future me, Paul said, eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. It has not entered into the house of man. The things that God has in store for you. I came to declare, you may be relegated. Things may be hard. People may reject you. But the future you, eyes have not seen. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. It has not entered into the house of man. The things that God has in store for you. Be on your feet. Listen to me. Regardless of where you are now, there is a future you. But God this is what God does. God hides your future in mystery. So God will hide the future prophet David in mystery. You know the way at times I, someone, I, I dress improper. You know, at times I don't tuck in. If you don't know me and I come with my untucked in and I wear my sunglasses and I go like that. <laughs> How many of you were here yesterday with a swag? I go like that. And with my sunglasses and a cap, ah, who is this guy? If I even ask you for a lift, look at me up down. You, lift. Now. Because God always hides greatness in mystery. You know why? Because he wants you to know the people who will stand with you in your time of nothing. So when? Now he reveals your greatness. You know, ah, Sister Mary, never. Brother John, no. Sister Nancy, no. But Brother James was there. Lift your hands. Lift your hands. The next thing which I couldn't touch on, on releasing your prophecy, is to release a seed on your prophecy. But that is for the future. Lift your hands. Say after me, in the name of Jesus. Say, in the name of Jesus. I declare from today every prophetic word I have received I claim it by fire by fire by fire by fire by fire by fire I declare as I begin to pray I push my prophecy I push my prophetic word from the spirit into the flesh, into the physical, lift up your voice and begin to pray.